You're listening to the Beat Motel Zine podcast, and we need to warn you that we use words like sh** and bollocks, scrotics, fuck, anarcho-syndicalist, and c**t, and, and we don't normally beat those words out, apart from the word c**t, because we're not total animals. Now, we know, as well as you, that your children can hear these words on any street in Britain, possibly any street anywhere in the world, but we also appreciate that you may not want to invite these words into your home if you have children or sensitive pets nearby whilst listening to this podcast. So listener discretion is advised. That being said, if your children aren't allergic to hearing words like f***, <coughs> shit, buttocks, or hind penis, they might learn something from listening to this podcast, although probably not because the quality of our educational content is quite poor. So there you go, fuckers, buckle in, and let's get started. Hello. It would be very impressive if you could actually start miming to that. Yeah. Miming along to it on the video, because yeah. we're on YouTube now, of course. Hello, Doctors, Patio Rage. Hello, Mr. Andrew Laws. Right, for those on YouTube, I'm going to hoist the you the uh, Beat Motel flag. There we go. <laughs> You're saluting. Yeah. <laughs> right, Dr. Sam, uh, what's our theme for today? Uh, well, I'll start with a joke. Uh, oh. What do you call someone who hangs out with musicians? Oh, is it a drummer? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's one of the first music, uh, music jokes I ever got told. It sticks with you. The, the first bassist one I got told was, uh, how do you know? Oh, I can't even remember. Oh, that's it. How do you confuse a bassist? <laughs> Go on. Detune one of his strings, but don't tell him which one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, there's another drummer. I can't remember. Uh, yeah. How do you know there's a drummer at the door? Because he, he knocks for 20 minutes and doesn't know when to come in. Oh, no. It's, uh, he speeds up. Ah. How do you know? How do you know there's a singer at the door? Is he knocks and doesn't know when to come in? Is that it? Yeah, yeah. yeah you got there at the end. <laughs> right. So today's today's episode is drummers. I've got a slightly runny nose, which I apologise for for anyone watching on YouTube. But you know, you pays your money, it takes your chance. You you get it. Right. <laughs> so <laughs> you get what you pay for, or whatever. Yeah, they are definitely getting what they pay for. Yeah. <laughs> right. Let's dive in with Riff of the Week. I'm going to go for yours first, and then you can tell us what it is. One fine morning, I woke up early. Bella ciao, bella ciao, bella ciao. One fine morning, I woke up early. Find the fashions at my door. Oh, Partigiano. Go on, what is that? Uh, that's Mark Ribot, uh, or Ribot, uh, and Tom Waits with Bella Ciao, which is, I'm guessing, not their original song. It was actually, it was a album that Mark Ribot, who is uh, frequently Tom Waits is sort of right-hand man guitarist chap um, did a cover of protest songs for oh. when, yeah this is like when That'd be a good episode to do protest songs yeah this is this is from when um, I believe this is a recording from uh, in reaction to maybe uh, the Ukrainian uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine but the song obviously goes way back. I'm not Bella Ciao, maybe the Italian, maybe it's Italian. Um, I haven't really done research, but you know, you can't fault performance by that performance by Tom Waits. He definitely sounds like fascists have turned up at his door and he's a bit depressed about it. <laughs> I, the Tom Waits' voice, I, I think I'm going to get into Tom Waits one day, like Leonard Cohen. Something's going to click in my head or I'm going to have a bout of being miserable or something and I'll just suddenly get it. Although I don't, that's unfair. I think Leonard Cohen's quite, quite glorious. But, but I, I... Um, oh, Tom Waits definitely isn't all uh, down. He sort of has different moments. I, I didn't, I haven't really got into his sort of later, his most recent period in a way. I think it's a bit, it's a bit, mm. but I love some of his sort of Great early age stuff. There. Mm-hmm. Mm. I, I've been using words. I like words. 
Right. Um, we we got to keep the pace going. We've got to keep the pace going because smash we have it, to keep to an hour today. So um, I'm going to go for my riff of the week, which is this. Come on. Do you know who that was, Sam? It sounded like Fuzzy. Fuzzy. <laughs> it's a band called Fuzzy. It's a band that you and I have seen together, I think, at least twice, but not for quite a few years. Pelican? What? Pel- Pelican? No, not... Oh, God, God, fucking... Nothing like Pelican. There's, I'm shocked. I know you don't give a shit about Pelican, so that's a fair comment, really. Uh, that is Truck Fighters. Remember? Oh, them? yeah, 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 yeah. I think we no. saw them supporting Fu Manchu and... I don't think I've seen Fu Manchu. Oh, well, maybe you weren't there. No, you weren't. Camden Underworld. It was with that band that only did solos, and we just went off to the bar and drank beer instead. <laughs> but there was, there was a band called, friends of mine called Sons of Alpha Century were on first, and it's Camden Underworld. But yeah, I just thought I'd go for an actual riff. I, I oh, think that's, that's, that's quite a fun that's, riff. You're, that's so, so cliche. That's what? So cliche of you. What, to uh, go for a riff in, in yes, the week? Yes, and not be post, post, post ironic. <laughs> or is I it you might, being post ironic? I might choose a deconstructed riff next week. Can uh, I tell you about the deconstructed lunch I had? What did you have? Like a piece of bread at 11 o'clock and then a piece of cheese at 12 and a piece of bread at <laughs> 1 o'clock? Just all spread out really nicely. <laughs> yeah. No, it was a place we went to in Southfold, and they did deconstructed cheeseburgers, and it was, they just chopped up the, the meat and, like, slung it on a plate and then just kind of spaffed stuff over it. I don't know why I'm going on about this. This isn't a food podcast. And um, Was it, anyway. was it, yeah, um, that doesn't sound that appealing. No. It, it looked like somebody had chewed a really big <laughs> cheeseburger and spat it back onto the plate. <laughs> <laughs> It was nice, I, actually. I'm, I'm not going to say the name of the place because I, I did actually enjoy it. But I, I had a, I, I much prefer the deconstructed cheesecake or something. It's much more palatable. We well, just eat an egg and then eat some cheese, <laughs> and then eat a biscuit. Yeah, basically. It's nice. <laughs> Maybe vanilla pod, scrape a vanilla pod with your tongue or something. I've only just learned that vanilla pods are the stamens of orchids. I could Great. be wrong there. That doesn't sound right, does it? <laughs> right, we ought to get on with this. So, drummers, now, as usual, we've chosen the theme, and Sam and I have chosen four songs each, of which we can't play any more than 30 seconds, otherwise we get spanked by licensing stuff. So I'm going to go for your first choice now, Sam. Now, as usual, we haven't discussed what angle we're approaching drummers from. It's just called drummers. And, yep. Sam, by the end of this episode, I'd like you to have thought up a good good title for this episode. But first of all, I'm going to play Sam Cooke, Twisting the Night Away, live at the Harlem Square Club in 1963. Which, that, that surprised me. That's quite a bit. One, a two, I put it in anyway. <laughs> You've shrunk. Sorry, YouTube. Uh, that sounds. How great is that? That's wonderful. Thanks for bringing that into my life. Uh, well, I, I only discovered it. Um, yeah, I only discovered that album like, last year or something. Apparently, it's, uh, and it was only that recording was only discovered in nineteen eighty five. It was recorded for a live album that they were going to put out when Sam Cook was alive, but they thought it was uh, it, it was a bit too raw. Uh, mm. 
for uh, going against this sort of smooth uh, public image because um, that was the touring band uh, that he played with and they sound like they're on fire. You know, it, it's an amazing sort of juxtaposition between the band who sound like they're racing through everything and Sam <laughs> Cooke who barely sounds like he's breaking his sweat and he could do it all yeah. night. Um, but the drummer, you know, there's nothing fancy going on. He's just driving everything. Mm. And it's an amazing sort of like, the whole album is like that. It just sounds like a, it, it reminds me of punk drumming in a way. It just sort of sounds like, or like at least sort of um, like old, not modern punk drumming, but like, um, I guess, I don't know how to describe them, like late 80s, early 90s, mid 90s sort of, pop punk drummers who just sort of uh really drive everything and everybody else is sort of trying to catch up with them like scooching weasels and trey cool and the first on on dookie um who is that performance is uh great and um just you know, like there's nothing that fancy going on it's just driving everything and it's the feel of it is created by that that sort of relationship between the drummer who's just got this, who is a bull of energy, you can almost sort of see steaming behind the band. Mm-hmm. And Sam Cooke, who's just sort of like standing there going, yeah, man, this is great. I know I'm great. This was, you know, great time. <laughs> I don't think I've ever heard his voice. I, I know I know the name, but already in this episode, I know it's going to be a fun one to discuss. If you say something, I realise I meant to pick one of those. I meant to pick like a, a pop punk band. I was going to pick like No Use for a Name or something as an example of that that kind of super driving beat and you and i have been at festivals where like half the band sounded like that and it's a great thing but oh no sam has disappeared what has he done what has he done is he coming back what did you do oh i don't know if he knows can you hear us oh he's gone again i might edit this bit out i might not it's real, man. We're talking about the grit and the... Uh... Hey! You're, you're going to have to do it again because I reckon that's going to do exactly the same thing as it did last time. What happened? Um, I knocked the button on the side of my computer by mistake as I continually do trying to prop this fucking thing up. So. Oh, I had to patch it all together last time, didn't I? Uh, sorry, man. That's all right. Screw it. Doesn't matter. I'm on annual leave today. Right, let, let's carry on. I was, I was talking about <laughs> pop punk and how we, we got fed up of the uh, the drum beat after a while and, and went home. Yeah, yeah, you want to change occasionally. But, you know, just as like, you don't want every drummer to do what that guy's doing. But if you can do what that guy's doing and you're good at it, do it. <laughs> do it. Right. And what's his name? I should, we should give him his name. His name is... Uh, Albert June Gardner. Good name. Yeah. The only other famous gardener I can think of is Mark Gardner, who was one of the singers in Ride. But there's no connection between Sam Cooke and 80s, uh, sorry, 90s shoes. Who's that guy who writes, uh, uh, well, there's a few famous gardeners I can think of. <laughs> yeah, I knew I knew <laughs> you were going to do that. And I, I was deliberately not doing that. But anyway, fuck you. Um, <laughs> right. I want to choose a, a drum... I was trying to intellectualize my first choice. I was trying to think of a drummer who's been on more songs than anybody else by a factor of something like five and a half thousand. Oh, so wow. you'll, you'll, I think you'll know what it is when I play it. Bar. That's so, the Amen break, isn't it? It is the Amen break by the Winstons. Amen Brother is the song. And I, I wanted to include it. There's an episode all about this, if you look back in the, the, the history of the podcast, because that, that drum beat spawned an entire genre. It's, it's absolutely brilliant. It's not that exceptional, I don't think, as a drum beat. It's just... It's got a nice turnaround in the middle of it. It has, hasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I, I was nearly. I, I was going to choose a beatbox track for one of these, and I thought no, because it would just lead to me trying to beatbox. And there's a little sample of what me beatboxing would sound like. I think you need a sample of your. I think you need a sample of your daughter just going, Dad. Cut me out of the wheel. I don't want it. Oh dear me! Now the wheel is going to be like 
an empty pouch of rolling tobacco and <laughs> a pen wool, that's a, run out. A Woolworths voucher. <laughs> Woolworths. Right, so that, I don't think, I, I don't want to talk too much about the, the Winstons because there is a whole fucking episode about it. So let's go on. A classic, classic, classic. Classic. Yeah. So let, let's nip on to your next track, which I'm going to play, then you can explain. You can explain yourself afterwards. All right. All right. <laughs> I'd like to thank the one listener who hasn't switched off for still being here. Oh, that's that's the the immortal and amazing um, Yoshida Tatsuya um, performing as Ruins Alone. The song is uh, Liar the Kig. I don't <laughs> think I don't think he he put that song title there to be pronounced. I think he's just swept his hand across the keyboard and just went, "Yeah, that'll do." But this guy is a, a legend in his own time um, and his own right, and he is—he he sort of came, I think, to like the international scene originally through this um, noise band called uh, Zeni Gabby or something like that, um, and then he sort of does this thing called uh, Ruins, which was just him and a bassist, and they. They, the the language they he sings in, and it's him singing whilst he's playing. The language he sings in is a made up language, very much in the style of that French band um, who sort of popularized that style. Who I can't remember ever well, remember. I, I'm trying to think other bands that have made up languages. There's there's Ziggle Ross, they made up a language as well. But they Ziggle Ross and and uh, Ruins Alone, I think, are two opposite ends of. Of, this, of a scale there. Um, the band's called Magma. They were like a classic French prog rock oh, band. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I know. I know the name Magma. Yeah. I mean that. That is. When do you put that on? I mean, like, I'm not adverse to it, but in my house, that would be a no. As soon as I, I play. Well, I put it on when my, I'm by myself and feeling <laughs> by myself. <laughs> frisky. <laughs> um, I I think I went through a period of about. When I lived in London, I discovered Yoshida Tatsuya. He he played London, London on a like a lunch, at least once a year. It felt like, and I would seek out every single performance of his. Um, I once saw his. He's just an amazing person to watch live. You know, it's like there's one thing listening to it, and yeah, I get that there's not a lot of patience, but to watch it, and there's a whole genre of drummers that have, I think, come in his wake of like people like Zach Hill and. Who works for you know who who who's famous in Death Grips now and oh. started out in Hella and there's Lightning Bolt and all these other sort of noise bands that come in the wake of Ruins and uh, Yoshida Tatsuya. What, what, what and, year is this then? Well, that one is 2011, maybe. Okay. But he's been going since like the mid 80s. See that 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 sort of music, I think live it can be just fantastic mm. um having made i can't really say i've made music like that but i've made difficult music to make is a lot of fun and, and i'm really pleased it exists and i think without that you wouldn't have any forward movement in music at all without stuff that's that wild and that that without borders and that that deconstructed it's not deconstructed is it they're fucking cramming it's like they've got all the tools and they're using all the tools at once yeah Yeah. and um but also i just the musicianship involved in it because he does also he knows exactly where he is in any piece of music he's playing i saw him play uh i saw him play a little plastic gazebo i guess in um in hyde park once and as as part of like this musical festival thing very very polite everybody sat down 
and some other person came on, and then Yoshida Tatsuya came on. I only wanted to see him, obviously. And um, the drums started, you know, like when you don't, they're not given, drummers aren't given a proper thing to hold it together, the drums start slipping away. Mm. He was pulling back the drums whilst keeping time with the hi hat. <laughs> and then the minute the drums were in the right place, he'd start going off again. And then it would happen again. And just the whole performance became that much more incredible that he is, he actually, these parts are written and he remembers them and he knows where he is. That, that's and one what of the, blows my mind. And yeah, you know, like there's an aspect of when he was doing Ruins and it was just him and a bassist, you sort of go, okay, maybe there's a jazz element to this, an improvisation, improv, improv uh, element to this. And maybe there is, I don't know. I've never sort of seen interviews or talked to a guy. Um, but um, he is incredibly precise, and he is he has these other bands. I mean that he does like they do a whole sort of prog rock aspects to them, and it's whole sort of quasi operatic singing. And it's I just, I'm just in love. I'm just in love with the guy. He's he's amazing. He's such an amazing musician. You you know there's that cliche that if you're in a band. For one thing, by the time you're middle aged like I am, you don't you, you 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 try and try not to let people find out you're in a band. Probably that's not true. That's complete crap. I've got a, we've got a quite a big venue we're trying to sell out at the moment. Um, but people go, oh, what do you sound like? Which is like the worst question you can ask any musician. I mean, if you're listening to this and you're not a musician, oh, what does your band sound like? Is just an awful question to be asked. So when he's asked, what do you think he says? Sorry, I don't speak Ooh. English. Uh, probably, uh, probably the the joy of uh, putting explosives in drum kits. Ex- explosive is the right word because you know um, the lad from the Who, <laughs> the lad, what was he called? <laughs> the drummer from the Who. They, they used to call him the patented exploding drummer. I think mm. that that title has been has been rightfully won away by your key, What's his name? You're sure you did that too, yeah. Um, and I, I think all these drummers that come in his wake, they're just, I mean, like, I don't know. Um, th- there's also, like, there's something, he does repeat riffs, which to me does make it listenable in a way that I never found something like Heller to be listenable, that listenable. Um, well, and, but yeah, I think it works much better live than it does in record in many ways. The joy of things that are, are that chaotic is that you find patterns in them. I mean, this is why I love kind of techno, especially if it's made with kind of found sounds or field recordings, because you, you find your own rhythms in it and you find your own tunes. Right, yeah. I am going to play a track that I've chosen because if one drummer is good, why not have two? Good, good, good. I mean, that bass sound as well. Man. Oh, it's wonderful. So go on, Sam, tell us what that is. I know it's my choice, but you you, you know this band better than I do by far. Um, that's the the Melvins. Mm-hmm. And that was A History of Bad Man or Bad Men? Bad a History man. of Bad Man. <laughs> bad Man. Um, oh, God, I was in a shop recently and this, this lady... That came on? No, no. This lady had... She was trying to get her child, who who's about two years old, to go with her granddad, his granddad, I guess, her dad. And she was like, blah, blah, blah. And she was speaking in, I think, Polish. And then she said, she looked at me, looked at the child, and then said to the child in, in really clear English, you go with granddad or you go with man, and pointed at me. And this kid went, ah, and ran over and like clutched <laughs> onto his granddad. And I was like, fuck's sake. I've become, like, I've become an, an existential threat to, to children I don't know. Become the bogeyman. Now, you know what? We always are the existential threat to anybody, um, but we're just, it's just not pointed out very often. <laughs> particularly, particularly as middle class white men, we are existential threats to basically everybody and everything. Oh, man. Um, yeah, so let, let, let's talk about the Melvins. So it's two drummers. I can't remember their names, but you know them. 
Uh, one is um, Mr. 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 Jack Mr. Carter, Mr. Yeah. Dave. I I look up Google everything. I don't know why you're not okay. googling it. But but I don't rely on my memory. This is a theory by called intrapassivity uh, by Slavov Zizek, which means that you. <laughs> If you can remember that, you can't remember the name of the drummers in the Melvins. So yeah, I I I, um, I looked this up more recently. Um, where is it? It's from the album. I know it's from the album. I've seen Animal. I know. Oh God, I should know the drummer as well. Yes, um, I do think less of you a little bit. But the theory of um, intrapassivity basically means that we're passing. Uh, things onto technology that we can't be bothered to deal with ourselves, ah. um, and uh, you know it's sort of all, the automation of, and it's the opposite of interaction. Uh, so it's interpassivity, so rather passivity rather than action. Um, the personnel is Cody Willis uh, on one side, and Dave, 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 Dave. Because <laughs> I just called him Dave, didn't I? <laughs> Dave. <laughs> Dale Crover, who we've talked about previously, and I've talked about previously, and I have no reason to have forgotten his name. Um, but Cody Willis, who uh, is an amazing drummer in his own right. Um, and, yeah. It's not two yeah. drum kits. It's sort of, it's sort of, it's worth looking up clips of Melvin's live. And I nearly used the live version of that because they, they're not two kits that are separate. They're sort of two kits that are mushed together. They do share bits, kind of mostly yeah, sim- yeah. symbols, I guess. But it's a sight to behold, and that is all I'm going to say about the Melwins because I think they're going to come up in a in an episode of their own right or something fairly soon because they are a big old band to explore. Yeah, but the, I mean, again, I think in a way, in a way that the that frankly, I think the double drumming thing came over better live than it did, did on record as well. You know, yeah, it's a bit like, yeah, you're right. You know, the heaviness there is like I, there's bits and pieces going on, but I can't really hear that distinctness of two drummers there. If if I'm honest, I got a little bored during that sixty that thirty seconds. Oh, I, I yeah, I mean, it's it, the anticipation, frankly, of waiting for that riff to come in, and it just like crushes your. I once I once uh, smoked a bit too much uh, wacky backy whilst drunk at a party once, and that came on. And it felt like there were wolves in my mind. I didn't, wacky backy, what an arse. Uh, but uh, marijuana, uh, weed, and the sound of the wolf, marijuana, Mary Jane, all these awful terms. Um, devil's lettuce. <laughs> devil's lettuce. <laughs> uh, it, but it felt it sounded, it felt like there were like wolves in my mind crumbling, you know, like oh. in the, the film of the wall. And I just sort of went, okay, I'm going to leave the party now. <laughs> Time to go home. <laughs> right. Uh, then your next choice is, is, is yeah. I'm... Go for it, Sam. Who was, who was that? that? Who, who was that? Who was that? You don't know who you you gave me the choices. <laughs> <laughs> That's Adam and the Ants with Car Trouble. Now, uh, yeah. when I was when I was clipping that in preparation for the show, I was really trying to figure out why you chose it. So I'm I'm looking forward to this. Well, the drummers, uh, frankly, uh, and this is my amateurism. I think it was one minute fifteen of a different song that I actually chose and forgot to change the title uh, of Car Trouble. <laughs> but mm, you can still hear in that fill. The, the drummer is a guy called Dave Barbarossa, uh, and he or David Barbarossa, um, who I think I might have met once or twice through my friend Lawrence, um, and he was also in Bow Wow Bow Wow Wow. Ah, I've always and, wanted that. I did most of the same thing, but very similar sound. Well, yeah, it was basically um, Malcolm McLaren convinced the band, he fell out with Adamant and convinced the band to leave Adamant and uh, try and find a young female singer so they could become more commercially successful. 
than adamant mm-hmm. um anyway um he that uh, so that's from the first album the first adam and the ants album dirt wears white socks and if you listen to dirt wears white socks the detailing of the instrumentation is second to none in a time where and and there's this really interesting sort of relationship in some way that is quite jazzy between the bassist and dave barbarossa um and um like the bass is quite constant whereas uh dave is sort of all over the shop um in his fills and he's pushing and pulling the beat and he's just sort of um, uh that 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 the drumming on that album is is uh details my friend lawrence again described it as the sound of someone falling over their drum kits downstairs and as like as a massive compliment of going it just sounds like uh it works and he the, yeah the drumming on the album is is second to none and he does it's really interesting instrumental choices and if anybody says you know the punks couldn't play they never listen to adam and the ants um because the musicianship particularly the bassist and drummer and bits and pieces of the production of the guitar on dirk wears white socks are the a beautifully instrumented, instrumented, orchestrated, orchestrated, um, and yeah, you know his 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 fills are all sort of pretty jazzy and pretty detailed. But he do, he also sort of he builds the drum kit, the drum beat. He doesn't do the same thing uh, again and again and again. He's he is that sort of like he relies on the bassist in Adam and the Ants on that first album. He relies on the bassist to be there whilst he plays around it it's a really it's, nice sort of juxtaposition of what I'm, the drums gonna, could do i'm gonna listen to dirk wears white socks again i've not listened to it for many many years but well half of my band claim it's almost one of their favorite you know, one of their absolute favorite albums i'm gonna play a little bit again but i'm gonna play a short bit because it sounds i thought you'd chosen it because there's what sounds like a slapback delay on the snare which is wild you never ever outside of dub I guess in where there's a lot of space around the drums, you never hear that. I'm going to play just a second. Car, trouble. Car, 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 not this, but not this. No. I don't think it's. It, I think he's just bouncing it, isn't he? Bouncing the stick yeah. on the on the snare. Yeah. Like, brrr like a little one one handed roll kind of thing yeah yeah yeah. cool as shit anyway that that's i I love the whole point of this podcast i've said before is for for us to share music and and for for me it's it's something like that where you hear something new in a piece of music and go right well there's a there's a rabbit hole i'm gonna go running down so that's that's cool as shit i'm gonna move on to my next choice i was trying to think of a drum a drum bit that gets stuck in my head and <laughs> I'm slightly worried about playing this because I think it took me years to get this out of my head when I first heard it and I get I get little loops stuck in my head and and the one that you've heard me almost as like a Tourette style tick do before is uh walking by Pantera is it dun, 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 dun. you've heard yeah, me humming yeah. that when we've just been hanging out and just gone why are you humming that you don't even like Pantera and I, I don't know this bit that I'm now going to play the drum bit at the beginning i'm I'm, gen- I'm not even joking i genuinely am nervous that this might now trouble me for months because it took me a long time to get out of my head right i've overhyped it now here we go i'm gonna do it just so i can hear it again I chose that for not just the reason that it gets stuck in my head because it's not, I don't know what it is about that. It's just so cool. 
But also I chose it because it's got Steve Albini's production on it and Steve Albini, I didn't want to do a drumming episode without talking about Steve Albini's drum drum engineering. Oh, yeah, I don't get Steve Albini, so you go for it. No, I just I just think he does drums nicely. <laughs> there's not there's not much further to go in that. I've, although I've read a lot about Steve Albini recently that made me feel quite uncomfortable. The things I just did not know. Um, like what? He's just very aggressive. Oh, very... you should. There was a, there was a Guardian. There's an interview with him and the Guardian uh, recently. Actually, weirdly, in the Guardian. I think um, it might be what, what you sent me and I read in that case. But he 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 sounds like he is trying to be like mere gulper about it sort of like mm. yeah i fucked up and i was an asshole and yeah. i did stupid things and actually that takes a lot more like that that's a lot more of a mature response than sort of going oh that was just the time and a place and you know okay i wouldn't do it now but you know fuck off no but, that that was that was i came out of that article overwhelmingly feeling it was a quite a roller coaster because I didn't know anything about Steve Albini. He's seen him play a bunch of times, know his work, and then to start that article, reading about the way he behaved in the past, and, and there's nothing like proper shocking, but just things that were a surprise. But by the end of it, his 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 message is kind of look, people like me who did things like this need to own it and move on because yeah. if you say it was just the way things were at the time, it, it's not an excuse. So I, yeah, in the end, I thought it was very good, very cool. Um, that. Go, let's go to Pat Dave Grohl. He's 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 not a great songwriter. <laughs> there, let's, let's stick to the bar because there, there's but, bits there's bits in but that. He is an astonishing drummer, and he. I was thinking. I, I heard the other day. I heard the opening of Teen Spirit somewhere. I don't know where it was. You know, these days Teen Spirit gets played in fucking uh, shops and stuff, mm. and. Um, he does something. I know he. I know there's a video of him talking about it online. But he does this sort of ability to take very simple. And this is a, another thing. Like you know, you get a lot of metal drummers, and we'll I'll talk about metal drummers in a bit. Um, but he does. You know, he makes really simple statements, and they stick, and they sound so good. And he is just a class. He's a classy drummer. Absolutely, he is, and that hearing in utero now, when it must be what thirty years old, there there are some really interesting things that Kurt Cobain's doing in there as well. Just like a, he's doing like a single note, and yep. it's an interesting rhythm as a whole. That you know, the sixth or seventh Nirvana album could have sounded brilliant, and it wouldn't have sounded anything like the Foo Fighters. <laughs> you know, it would have been yep. potentially really good, and but 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 we'll never know. So I'm going to move on to your next. We choice. could ask. Oh. We could ask AI. We could ask AI to write a new Nirvana album. All <laughs> right. More about AI in a minute. Let's play progressive progress. Pro- progress. Let's play your last choice. that sam that sepultura they oh, yeah. never sound like how i expect them to every sepultura song i i i hear is always a well i've got to say a very delightful surprise i really need to listen to, to more of them it's so much more well, punk than i was expected to be they yeah i mean completely but they they change like every single album under max Cavera is compl- almost completely different from the previous one but there's something that stays the same about uh, you know that is uh, sonically there's a signature there that uh, you can identify as Sepultura, um, and Max Car- uh, Igor Caravera, who is the drummer, is uh, I think he was the drummer who, yeah, yeah, the two brothers started Sepultura, and um, I think it was his drumming that sort of made me fall in love with metal drumming that I've just never, it just, and it's not you know he he he's. 
Yeah, it, he's uh, or it not. Yeah, I mean, I think about that. The Metallica, you know, sort of like I was, I was amazed by. I don't know what I'm trying to say. You say something. Um, I I, th- I think we, when when I sat down to look at my choices, I thought metal is going to come into this because it just flat out has to. Choosing the jumping in point was what was really difficult because there's really interesting bands like Don Cab- Caballero. I've never figured out if it's a band or a person, if I'm honest, but I always right. really enjoy it when it when it when it comes on a random. Uh, a friend of mine polluted my MP3 collection with with just a load of music, so it pops up. You've polluted my MP3 collection at some point in the past as well, which is how I discovered kind of quite a lot of music. But the Sepultura one, it's I like looking at Sepultura through that sort of different lens because that drumming is wonderful and it's not straight up metal drumming you you know more metal than i do there's nothing but it gives it so much texture it's yeah it's just good it's just a good choice sam so and but he he like i was was thinking of the you know to me and this might i don't know what your next choice is but the other i think there's 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 a lot of amazing musicians in metal but i don't think they always know I think they always want to play. Sometimes drummers, particularly drummers in metal, want to play everything all the time. And Eagle Caravera is a great example of someone who can push and pull when to play a lot and when to just actually lay down a groove. And um, to me, the greatest metal drummers are him and Bill Ward. Like you don't get better than that. They are. They are the standard. Um... For my final choice, I've, I've gone for black metal because apart from like the weird disco beat black metal, I think a lot of black metal drummers ought to get paid twice as much as the rest of the band because they put in more than twice as much work. As for which black metal drummer to choose, it was it was too difficult because the the main beat, the real like blast beat, black metal it comes down to how well produced it is and quite frankly i had five minutes before i had to run out of the house to come to the studio to record this so i just chose something that i'd heard i've listened to most recently There's like three different speeds the drummers are in that, which completely backs up what you were saying about drummers always adding more texture and they don't just go full on. There's the full on, which the production isn't all that great, so it does let down the point a bit. But then it just stops and it just puts some air in and then does it sort of half half time, which is oh, I want to say who that is. That's ba- ba- Batushka. Um, you saw the, the original the real one, Batushka. The, yeah, the, the original one. I, I, it's an interesting aspect because as I remember when I was, this is be in the early 2000s before I would say Double Kick had become uh, synonymous with extreme metal. Um, you know, that was certainly there, but it wasn't always synonymous and it was, wasn't as uh, dominant as it is particularly nowadays. And there was an argument that uh, amongst, I remember the drummer I played with in the band, um, there was a sort of an idea that uh, double kick, once you got that, it was actually laziness. Uh, yeah, we I, I used to absolutely believe that until there's a really good drummer I've mentioned before on this called Zach, who's been in oh, loads of metal bands. First time I saw him live with double kick, I was like, it's not lazy. <laughs> it's really, really, really not lazy. You got third Isis album's the only one that's got got kick on it, and the drummer basically had it took him about a year to teach himself how to do it, and he was already an incredibly accomplished drummer. No, it's not lazy. It's God, look at Meshuggah. If you're going to no. tell me anything Meshuggah are doing is lazy because it's got double kick, you're a fucking idiot. Well, this is this is it, and it's like you can do really, you know, it's another thing you can do really interesting things with like Meshuggah and. Uh, to an extent, well, to a similar sort of like 
thing fear factory do these sort of you know really intricate relationships of rhythm between in the within the band and the, um and i don't i mean i don't think uh it is laziness i what i what i struggle with in these this side of things is that it has become it has become uh such a thing to 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 rely on that double kick so much um whereas if you sort of take a lot of i like like i didn't i don't think i noticed when i, I you know my first my earliest memories of metal are, is uh, metallica really and i don't think i ever noticed the double kick drum not because Lars Ulrich can't do it it's because he chooses when to do it and when not to do it and then you listen to sort of a, even early Cannibal Corpse and that drummer, I can't remember his name, but he's a great, you know, there's no stopping like metal musicians are probably as musicians go amongst the best touring, but they don't, they always, they sort of don't pull their, uh, they don't pull their punches all the time when they perhaps should do more often. That's what I guess I'm saying. There, there's a brilliant series, YouTube series, which I don't know if I can look up. Well, let, if I if I mute this tab, I might be able to look it up. But a YouTube series where they they get hold of the, I guess the stems of songs, so they'll get just you know, everything other than the drums, and then they'll play that to a drummer from a different genre. Oh yeah, I've I've, I've seen that. Yeah, uh, just there's there's a woman drummer, a woman drummer. There's a drummer. Late I'm only drum. saying women. I'm trying to remember what I'm saying. Women to try and jog my memory into remembering what she talks like. Um, what she talks like. What she talks um, like. What she talks like. <laughs> what her name is, but she, lady drummer, it's astonishing. Just she, her understanding. She's a pop drummer, but her understanding when they play a metal is just adds so many more dimensions to it. But one of the very best ones I saw was the drummer of a really big metal band. I can't fucking remember which one, and they play him something poppy. And of course, he doesn't just thrash out a metal. Oh, it's the it's the current Megadeth guy. That's it. That's it. You're completely right. Yeah. It's the Megadeth drummer. And of course, he doesn't just thrash out. Oh, I'm a metal drummer, so I'm going to do metal. He does an interpretation of it that's absolutely fantastic. So I think we've got a conclusion for this episode that metal drummers are better than any other drummers. Uh, I, yeah, but they need to pull their punches more often. Yeah, they they need more more joy of texture. More enjoy the texture and uh, yeah, let it breathe, let it breathe, and then crush it. Right, so we've got a little bit of time left. So we've had a letter from Rodica Brimhilda, and he sent a picture of himself, which I've just sent to you by WhatsApp. Have you got your phone nearby? So we'll include the picture in the show notes as well on the website um, version of the podcast. It's not He's come not, through yet. It's not come through. Oh no, I sent it to someone else entirely. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> All right, I need to quickly undo that. I've just sent it to our mortgage advisor. <laughs> <laughs> there is, oh God, for fuck's sake. Oh, how am I going to explain this? Oh man, right. I've definitely sent it to you now. Can you, you, you talk about that image while I send a message to my mortgage advisor? <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> oh, oh, oh! It it looks like um, he got very excited. Uh, this Randy guy, um, he's got he's invested in moustache wax. That's even more moustache wax. To the point where it looks a bit like it's a bit crusty, uh, maybe a bit too much, or maybe he's got a problem. Um, but yeah. So this know. is Rodica Broomhilda. We for anyone who who hasn't listened to the show for a while. I have created and programmed an AI super fan because we keep asking you to to email in with questions and stuff, and we're not we're not really getting any. So we've created Rudika Broomhilda, and the picture that I've just sent is well. If I, look, why is the why is the pizza mucky? Look, he's eating pizza off a dirty plate. You well, see? I don't know. Why is there a bit of jam on it? What the hell um, is that in his it's... top in his pocket? And I don't know, it's sort of like, oh, he's a mad scientist, eccentric, and he also has a dirty kitchen behind him. Oh, um, man, he really does. That's vile. Right, so he's, he's we, we, did a, we did a letters special where... He's aged since we last saw him. <laughs> we did a letters special where, where we read the letters that this AI 
super fan wrote and because we did a whole episode about it of course Rudika Broomhilda our AI super fan was quite excited I'm going to read you the email he sent us okay the subject line is the day beat the day the beat motel universe collided with Rudiger's world right so he's talking here about about the episode basically so I'm gonna I'm gonna read read his email and I'm going to stop when there's a, if there's questions that we can answer them. Dear Dr. Andrew. No. Oh, good start, hey? Dear Andrew and Dr. Sam, or should I say Dr. Napalm Duck today, I must say my world turned into an ecstatic mosh pit of joy where my ears graced the unexpected melody of my own name, Rudica Broomhilda, in your latest podcast episode. I have been dancing on cloud nine, perfectly in sync with the beat, of course, ever since. First off, Andrew. Your efforts to obscure the background with the flag are noble indeed. It adds a layer of mystery, almost as if we're all part of some underground music revolution. Here's my question, though. If you had to choose a flag that perfectly represented the spirit of Beat Motel, what would it look like? Are we talking guitars crossed like swords, a majestic eagle holding a microphone, or perhaps something so avant-garde it can't be described in mere mortal words? Right, so I'm going to answer that question. Uh, it would look exactly like the the sticker that, that I've made. Um, although the idea of having like a tape bobbing around in a toilet or something is quite appealing for some reason. Sam, what, what do you think the Beat Motel uh, flag would look like? Uh, moldy cheese. <laughs> moldy cheese. Right, so... Because um, we both like moldy cheese. We do both it? really enjoy moldy cheese. God, that lovely if you want to send us anything send a package of molding cheese to Andrew. <laughs> as long as it's cheese that's meant to be moldy right send it to his po box are you ready for your letter sure okay so i'm going I'm going I've got channeling rudka broomhilder again now on to you dr sam the man of a thousand names each more intriguing than the last your sartorial choice of the napalm duck t-shirt has inspired heated debates and philosophical musings in my circle so dr sam admits your myriad of personas which one resonates most with your true self and how does this alter ego influence your perception of the music you discuss well i subscribe uh to some extent, to the uh, writings of Goodlees and Guattari, which suggest there is no truth self and that we're always becoming. And uh, therefore, any idea of a reference to the truth self is a misnomer and all that hippie shit is wrong. <laughs> yep, I'll go with that. Cool. Right. So <laughs> let, let's, the final bit of his letter. Your podcast is, this is where he gets onto the kind of uh, type thing. Your <laughs> podcast is like a backstage pass to the concert of life, with each episode more riveting than the last encore of the night. Thank you for the shout out. It's like a crowd surf that never ends. And honestly, I'm here for it. Keep the beats eternal and the motel's lights burning bright. Rocking the ethers, Rudika Broomhilda then. Load of emoticons. So, <laughs> thank you very much, Rudica. Um, what oh. we do, we I basically how can, how can we how can we insult him to the point where he actually just stops listening to us? I don't think he can. I, I probed down. I probed down him to a never tire of us. Maybe I ought to. <laughs> Maybe I ought to say, look, <gasps> yeah. This when when he listens to the next episode, I think Rudica Rudica ought to hate it. I yes, I want him to be disappointed. Uh, I want him to at least uh, we we should at least at the very least be sellouts. Hi kids, drink coke. <laughs> right, so Rudica um, is my he's going to be he's going to be miffed next time, which I think is going to be really interesting. Good. Can he swear? Does he is he allowed to swear? I good question actually. If I program him to swear, he can swear, but he won't use that word that means I have to edit things out. Which please don't say it. No, I don't say it. it. No, that's all right. You can say that <laughs> as, much as, as many hind penises as you want. Right, Sam. We have actually managed to do this in time. So thank you very much, dear listener. I would really love you to subscribe and please tell your friends because it does make a big difference. I mean, it it. It does. And if we get enough people listening, then maybe Sam will stop switching his laptop off halfway through the recording. Well, maybe this becomes a theme, though. And then... A theme? Don't, because it's a pain in the ass to edit. <laughs> yeah, I bet it is. I'm sorry about that. Andrew. Right, I'm going to say goodbye. Do you want to say goodbye? No. No? <laughs> <laughs>